Hello and welcome everybody to the Prince Philip Maritime Collection Centre. My name is Matt Carhill and it's a pleasure to welcome you back for our second, this, yes, our second Facebook Live and YouTube Live event. So happy to have you. So where on earth are we? Where is this Prince Philip Maritime Collection Centre we talk about? So the Prince Philip Maritime Collection Centre, I think is the best way to describe it, is the engine room of Royal Museums Greenwich. Royal Museums Greenwich is made up of four fantastic sites, which I'm sure you have heard of. The National Maritime Museum, the Cutty Sark, the Queen's House and the Royal Observatory. Together, those four sites have a collection of two and a half million objects. And these objects belong to you. We're just the custodians, so at the end of the day, we need to look after them. And they don't fit in all the galleries, so what we do, we store them and care for them here. And how do we look after them? Who looks after them? Well, one of those people is here today. Hi, Ashley, how are you? I'm good, Matt, how are you? Excellent. So I've said you're one of the people who look after yep. them. <laughs> What's your role? Tell us about what you do. Well, specifically, I'm a textile conservator and I'm one of two textile conservators here at the centre. And so our role is to look after the textiles. And that sounds quite simple, but actually we have a huge number of textiles and the range is massive. So we have uniforms and flags and clothing and accessories and toys like <gasps> we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about toys and I can't wait. So. Each time we do one of these broadcasts, um, we have a different theme. And this one, we're celebrating what we're calling our summer of play. We're out of lockdown. We want to play. We want to learn. And toys are so important. So this session is all about toys. And who doesn't love toys, you know? Um, toys are important. They're for learning. They're for development. And they're for creativity. And so tonight, we're going to find out how they link and how they fit within our collection. And we've got many special items coming up. Now, we've got a question for you guys tonight because we are live, we want to hear from you. So in the chat boxes below, please feel free to leave us a message. We wanna know what your favorite toy is. So while I'm asking that, what's your favorite toy, Ashley? Well, my favorite toy has got to be a teddy bear that I've had since I was a child. I think I've had this bear for really as long as I can remember and it's a little it's quite a small pink fluffy teddy bear which I called snuff <laughs> children come up with the best names I don't know why it's called snuff I really I have no idea why I called it snuff it makes no sense but um, snuff 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 snuff's great my name. favorite bear snuff's a great name um talking about teddy bears shall we go to our first yeah, item definitely we are here in the um, stores and we've got a special item here can you just Tilt that to the camera. Brilliant. Hopefully you can see. This is not snuff. This, this is, is not snuff. Definitely not snuff. This is Humphrey. And Humphrey is a very special bear. Now, Humphrey looks absolutely shattered. Mm -hmm. He looks a lot older than he actually is. In fact, believe it or not, I am older than Humphrey. I'm also hum older than Humphrey. <laughs> oh, <yeah. well. laughs> but you, Humphrey has been loved. And that's what happens with toys. You know, when they've been taken out of the box and moved and moved around and roughed up that's where the character comes in and Humphrey has got character as you can see on the screen now this is Humphrey and Humphrey belonged to a very special person back in 1989 there was a, a lady called Tracy Edwards who was part of the Whitbread round the world yacht race now she wanted a lucky mascot and this is it Humphrey was her lucky mascot and she was the first captain of an all-female crew to go around the world in the Whitbread round the world race now in that race everyone was saying she didn't have a chance you know women couldn't do it and that was in 1989 which is quite shocking really um, very upsetting that as recent as that but she proved them all wrong they um, came second in their class they won mm -hmm. seven of um, the heats which is really good out and she was part of she was captain of a crew of 12. Now, part of the uh, race in the Atlantic, it got turned up inside the Maiden, which was the name of the art, and we got turned upside down. A lot of the items on the ship got lost, Humphrey being one mm. of them, and they got really disappointed and a bit upset that Humphrey disappeared. When Humphrey got disappeared, they had to go, well, we'll have to just crack on. 
And at the end of the race, when they came into LA and they were very good at marketing themselves, she was a rebel, which we like a rebel, mm -hmm. um, she broke the rules because usually they had to wear all white. And uh, a bit like Wimbledon in the yeah. tennis, but instead she said, no, we want to show that we're strong, powerful, and they wore pink shorts instead. So they really want to show their femininity and their strength at the same time. But when they came in and they were cleaning the yacht afterwards, they found Humphrey, the only boy allowed on the, on the yacht, in the bilge pump. So in the pump, Humphrey was there and he was battered, but he survived, which is really exciting and yeah. really good to know. And it actually, the reason why it tells this great story. So, Ashley, I've got a couple of questions mm -hmm. for you. I love Humphrey. I think he's amazing. But coming from a conservative's perspective, why, what, why haven't we put any legs on him and repaired him to, to restore him to looking like a, like a brand new teddy? Well, that's a good question because... Um, a lot of people might think that, and a lot of people might think that with lots of museum objects, why they don't look better, why they don't look nice and clean and new. And the reason that a lot of things don't look nice and clean and new and why Humphrey looks like, well, the state that he's in, is because he tells this amazing story. And you have to imagine, if he was a nice, shiny, clean, brand new, four-limbed <laughs> teddy bear, he probably wouldn't tell that story so well. So uh, that's the reason why we would make Humphrey stable for display if we were going to put him on display. But we wouldn't, we wouldn't put new eyes on him or new legs or yeah. probably wouldn't even sew up his little arm there. No. Really, yeah. So his little, his little, little flappy arm, hasn't he? I know, it's it? more like a little wing now than, than an arm. All the stuffing is gone. <laughs> but um, yeah, with, with, with all new parts and all nice and shiny and clean, he wouldn't be... Tracy Edwards Humphrey, he no. would just be a teddy bear. Probably from Hamley's one of exactly. a thousand. Exactly. Yeah. So what is he made from? Let's look at, let's, because you guys, I, I like to, I'm the storyteller tonight. You're the material, material girl, yeah. in the words of Madonna. <laughs> Sorry, we didn't plan that bit, but anyway, we'll call you the material girl. Um, yeah, so tell us about the material, what is he made from? Because that's what we need to know, isn't it? Yeah, so Humphrey's made from a synthetic fur fabric. Um, I can't see what he's stuffed with, um, but I would imagine, based on his age, that he's probably stuffed with a synthetic stuffing, like a polyester wadding or something like that. And he has, uh, I would assume, some metal in him as well, metal holding his arms on and holding where, well, where his legs were and also the eyes. And the reason I think that is because you can see this reddish-brown staining on his fur, and I imagine that is the metal portions of him rusting and corroding probably when he was sitting in the seawater for so long and now the rusted metal has stained his fur. So I guess those are the kind of things you would be putting into a condition report when exactly. if a new item came into our care, a different teddy bear or a different item, you would spot that out. Exactly. Cool. Excellent. So that's our first item. We've got so many cool toys coming up. Toys you can cuddle, toys you can use your creativity and imagination with, and we've got some toys which bring us together. But what we want to know, definitely, if we want to know what your favourite toys, definitely put them in the chat, and if you've got any questions for us, we're more than happy to answer them. So we're going to come up, we've got so much coming up, really have, but what we've got, toys come in so many different shapes and sizes, and some are mechanical, some are fluffy, mm -hmm. but the best ones, personally, are the ones which bring us together. And during lockdown, I felt that board games and cards are really way of bringing people together. Also, maybe separating. So, what, what's your favourite? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'll ask you that one later. <laughs> but one game I used to bring my family together a lot is Domino. So let's go and have a look at this short video we made earlier in the week about a very special Domino set. So, toys come in many different forms. Some are fluffy, some are mechanical, some are powered by electricity. Now, my favourite kind of uh, games are ones which bring people together. And when I look at this, it always reminds me of my grandma on a Sunday night coming together and playing Dominoes. Dominoes is a very popular game which brings people together. It's a, it's a great, very competitive game. But this is no ordinary domino set, as you can see. This domino set here is 
We've got the don't one of our dominoes here, but actually inside this beautiful case, we've got our, all our other dominoes in here. But as you can see, it's not just dominoes, it's a cribbage board as well, so you can count along here. Now, what is this made from? This is actually made from bone. Why on earth would you make a domino set out of bone? Now, this is because this is made by a French prisoner of wars, and this would have been around, we believe, around 1805. Now, the reason why we think it may be after 1805, this is the lid to the cribbage board there. And this lid here has an illustration of Admiral Nelson, and we believe that this gentleman here is mourning the death of Admiral Nelson. It's the decoration which makes this really special and unique. Now, you've got the British flags in here, the Union Jack, the Union flag. You've got Admiral Nelson on here as well in his memory. Now you've got to remember these are painted by people who aren't British. They're painted by the opposition, by the prisoners, the captured prisoners. Now you've got to find it must be so difficult to have been one be captured too, then to be forced to paint patriotic imagery for the enemy. Now a lot of the prisoner of war art not around this time did have little secret messages, hidden uh, battle cries, could you say, from the French, where they would paint little tricolors or, or of little French messages in there. Now, if you come on one of our tours in the future, you may see some of our um, prisoner of war ship models, where actually some of them have been made using French rigging. So they would put in their own skills with their own culture, which is a kind of a two fingers salute, even though the French didn't do that towards the Brits. Hi, and welcome back to Behind the Scenes Live with Royal Museums Greenwich. I'm Matt Carhill, and I'm with, here with Ashley Macken, and we are looking at toys. Um, that video you just saw was a very special toy. Now, the thing about the Prince Philip Maritime Collection Centre, where we store items which aren't on display, I call it House of Memories because these items have stories, they're not just objects. And when you come and interact with them, they, their narrative gets bigger. And that item you just saw is important to me, not just because of its relation to uh, the prisoner of war, but also really important because two years ago we had our first ever Heritage Open Days, and our first Heritage Open Days was we worked with our local community group, the Caribbean Social Forum, and they picked that item as their favorite item in the collection because they love how games bring us together. Now this year, on this year's Heritage Open Day, the theme is all about food. Mmm, yum, yum, yum. So our tours, which are gonna be happening on September from the 13th of September to the 18th, we're gonna be running free tours, um, running every day, and if you're wanting to book those tours, keep an eye out for after the 30th of July, when they are available, I'll remind you again in the future. But please definitely come down to see that because we're gonna have loads of great items all based around food. Yum, yum, yum. Excellent, so what we're going to do, we're gonna go back to our theme today, which is all about toys. I nearly asked you before, but I'll ask you again. <laughs> I'll ask you again. What's your favorite board game? So we, we know what your favourite toy, that was Snuff. Snuff's the favourite toy, yeah. favourite board game is, like we were talking about uh, earlier, about board games bringing everyone together. And I was telling Matt that uh, my favourite board game, or maybe not my favourite board game, but my, some of my fondest memories are playing Monopoly with my family as a child, which I think everyone knows that Monopoly doesn't always bring everyone together. In fact, there are many fights, many feuds, <laughs> lots of cheating, lots of hoarding properties. Oh, it didn't, wasn't something that inspired uh, a good family, family get together. Capitalist fun, who yeah, says, exactly. come on, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> and actually designed to, yeah, <laughs> to teach the downfall of capitalists, but yeah. don't think it quite worked like yeah. that. Um, <laughs> so we've got a video coming up from another colleague of us, um, Louise Dufour, who's one of our curators, and she's telling you about her favourite toy within the collection. This is a board game, a very special board game, and it tells us about 
how our collection is connected to some of our sites as well. And this game is connected so much to one of our sites, it actually is based around the Royal Observatory. So I hope you enjoy this video of Louise telling us about her favourite toy. Hello, my name's Louise, and I'd like to share with you this board game called Science in Sport or The Pleasures of Astronomy. And what I really like about this object is the fact that it has so many great links with the Royal Observatory at Greenwich with, that just make it so unique. So first of all, it was created in 1804 by Margaret Bryan, a well-respected local teacher based in Blackheath. And we can see here that she's even signed her name here just to give it her official seal of approval. And it's particularly impressive because she's even included the recent discovery of the asteroid Ceres in 1801. So all of her content is bang up to date. So how do you play this game? Well, it's a pretty classic format where you have to move your token around the board and whoever gets to the middle first here at the Flamsteed House is crowned the Astronomer Royal. And I'm sure many of you will recognize this view from Greenwich Park. So you move your tokens around and you might expect to use a pair of dice, but dice in the Georgian period were associated with gambling and bad influences and definitely not suitable for children. So instead, players had to use a sort of spinning top with a series of numbers on it to help them move their tokens along the board. So once you land on a square, you then have to complete a task. And some of these tasks were fairly simple. You just had to recite some of the information from the associated guidebook or perhaps read aloud from here. But some of the other squares were more demanding and expected you to explain the phases of the moon, same here, or perhaps how a telescope works. So you really had to know your stuff to play well. Some of the other squares would give you an extra spin perhaps, or some of the others would send you straight to jail as you can see down here at number six. And worst of all, if you landed on number 12, you would be deemed to be a blockhead or a stupid idiot and would face instant dismissal from the game. So while I really like this object, it's definitely not designed to be a fun game. It's really aimed at parents who want to teach their children not just about astronomy, but also about the morals of working hard and being good at your studies. So do keep that in mind when you take a closer look. Hi, we really hope you're enjoying the show today. We're enjoying having you. Thank you for all your comments and likes and some brilliant answers of telling people what their favourite toys. Keep sending them through to us on our social media pages, on Facebook and on YouTube, and we look forward to reading them out later on in the show. So, <laughs> that's a game which brings people together. Mm -hmm. Now toys come in different forms. We've had the cook, like the comfy snuggy, like with your teddy bear, we've had the family one. But actually some of the ones I really like are like this doll here. Yeah. And this doll, dolls are really important because dolls are great for building creativity, imagination, storytelling, visual literacy, you know, all these fantastic things. But also dolls are great for aspiration. You know, they aspire to... So, obviously, when I was growing up, the dolls I played with... Well, I, I would have had Action Man, I had... Oh, loads of different... I had Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, let's be honest. Who they were, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but my sister, she had Barbie, and I used to always look at Barbie, and she was really, really pretty. But I always thought, where was her purpose? Mm. Now, I look at this doll here. Hopefully, you can see this fantastic doll. Now, I look at her, you know exactly what her purpose is. Now, this doll is very special. This is from 1917. This is a Jenny Wren doll. And Jenny Wren comes from, from the acronym WRN, so the Women's Royal Navy. And the Women's Royal Navy started in 1917, around the same time this was made. And this was a promotional device, clever bit of marketing, not for children, believe it or not. Um, it was actually for adults. And this one here was given to a fiancé by her boyfriend who was leaving to go off to war in the First World War. And it was a way of promoting, saying, hey, while we're away, can you help out? And if you look at her, she's got her uniform on, which we'll talk in a bit more detail. She's got these blue loops on, which are really important because they are 
sign of the Women's Royal Navy, which actually carried on until 1993, when it finally got rid of the term WRN, and it just became the Royal Navy, mm -hmm. and men and women were actually both equally in there. It wasn't until the 1980s when women didn't swim until the front line, which is you know, quite shocking, really. But it was because there was such low sign-ups sign mm. from men um, during the 1980s, women were finally allowed to move in. And it was the women's lib movement which really s supported and promoted that. So finally, actually, there's so many women, it, female officers now, st thriving in the Royal Navy, which is amazing, which this is why this is an important doll. But let's have a look at the material of it, um, Ashley. So, you know, what is it made from, first and foremost? So she's made from uh, metal wire that's been wrapped with wool thread. And you can see, you can really see it in her little hands there. You can see sort of where the, the metal wire has been folded back on itself to make these little loops that are now her hands. And um, so she's been wrapped in the wool thread. Her face is really beautiful. Her face, it's a cotton fabric, but it's, the cotton is covering um, a bead or a button of some kind, possibly made of uh, wood. Um, it's difficult to tell because you can't see it. Mm. But it, the face has been painted on and is really amazing. Um, she has, you know, her little eyes. The maker has given her rosy cheeks and a little bit of lipstick. Um, and they've done a really amazing job sewing on her hair as well in what I imagine was quite a fashionable hairstyle at the time and given her a little wool hat to match her wool jacket and wool skirt. And the, the detail on this doll is amazing. She's just so beautiful. She's absolutely stunning. Now, we want to keep her being stunning for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. That's why she's in this special environment. She's mm -hmm. out of her box today um, <laughs> for you guys. But what my concern is something like this. What are the agents' deteriorations? What could be a hazard which could eat away or deter uh, deteriorate this 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 material, what were the main things we would need to protect her from? So one of the main things that we need to protect her from, and actually all the textiles, is light. Light is really damaging. Um, you may know already that light causes textiles and colors to fade. So obviously we don't want her fading and becoming kind of bleached out. But light can also cause uh, certain types of textile fibers to become really brittle and cause them to break, which obviously we don't want that to happen either. So here in our stores, we have very controlled light levels, and in our galleries as well in the museum, all the light levels are very controlled. The lights here in this store will actually turn off when we leave today, so they, they're more motion-censored lights, so that's really helpful for us to try and limit the amount of light that these types of objects may receive when they're out for events like this. Um, but with this little doll, I would also be concerned about pest damage because she is made of wool and her little outfit is made of wool. Um, so what we do here in the stores and in the museum is we have a very, um, uh, really rigorous program of pest management. So we have what we call blender traps or sticky traps. You may have seen them around the museum in the past, and they basically just catch anything that might be in the area, which sounds a bit weird, <laughs> but that way we can look at the traps and really see what's in our galleries and what's going on. Here in the center, what we do for anything coming in, it either gets frozen or quarantined for a period of time, and that will just ensure that anything that might be on it is completely dead, so we don't have any pests at all in the centre here. Well, what a lovely item. We put these away somewhere nice and safe and we're going to get our, one of our big star items out. Just a little reminder while we show the next video, we want you to be involved. This is your collection. Tell us about your favourite items you've seen in the museum. Tell us about your favourite toys. But if you've got a question for us, we're more than happy to answer it tonight. But I'm not feeling very well, Ashley. I know. What's wrong, Matt? I've got a fever.
Oh, Do you no. know why? I've got football fever. Hey, I probably a lot of you have at this time of year, but we've got a fantastic video. Believe it or not, you probably were. I know it was bad, wasn't it? That was I good. Resist. I like that. That oh, was really good. It? I okay. liked it. That was good. Well, I probably have complaints. <laughs> it was cheesy, but hey, who doesn't like cheese? But we've got this fantastic video. Um, about football. You wouldn't think we'd have a football in our collection, but we do. Let's have a look at this fantastic item. So what do we have here? Now, you're looking at, go, we're at the, we're in the stores of the National Maritime Museum, Royal Museums, Greenwich. You know, our collection tells stories about the ships, sea and the stars. Why has this guy got a football out? Well, you're right, it is definitely a football. It looks very modern, you're right. This is from 2018, and it's created by artist, conceptual artist Mark Wallinger, who's part of the Liverpool Biennale. But why is it in our collection, and why does it link to toys? Now, obviously, I see football as probably the most popular sport and game and toy in the world. You know, it crosses languages, it is brilliant. And that's what Mark Wallinger wants you to think as well. As you can see, we are in our 3D store, and I'm holding a 3D object, which is a ball. But behind me, you'll notice we have all, a lot of our globes behind us. And I think it's quite fitting that this ball is also covered in imagery, imagery of the world. Where does this imagery come from? So these aren't ordinary photographs. These photos are actually from Apollo 9. Apollo 9 was some of the first imagery from space of the Earth as a whole, which is really cool. So we've got a ball, which unites people together. We've got a picture of the world as one together. It's like a giant big portrait of the world, which is lovely. Now, it was also made to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the First World War. Now, as some of you may know, in the First World War, on Christmas Day, the, the English forces and the German forces stopped, put their weapons down, and for a short period of time came together to have a game of football. What the artist wants you to think when looking at this ball, and in its title, One World, that, you know, one, one ball like this can bring people together for a short period of time. They can play games, they can have fun. But what's even more interesting that this is this ball to me, I think it's beautiful. It's in great condition. You can tell we've looked after it. But a ball shouldn't look like this. A ball should be rough and ragged and burnt out on the edges where it's been kicked along concrete. This ball, one of a hundred, as I said. But where are the other ninety-nine? The other ninety-nine balls can be found all around the world where Mark Wallinger donated them to countries which were undergoing war at the time, so basically Syria. And these balls were given to the locals to play and actually get them to connect with each other. Because at the end of the day, toys aren't just for fun. They're a way of bringing people together. Hi, and welcome back to Behind the Scenes Live at the Prince Philip Maritime Collection Centre. Wow. I like that football, but I'm going to stick with what I say. It does need to be kicked around. <laughs> you know? um, we are hearing from you guys with what your favourite toys are. Someone's told us that their favourite toy is um, E.T., which is cool. I That's love really E.T., cool. but, it was, but the, it was not an ordinary E.T. E .T. It's a female E.T. who's also a pirate, so that's cool. I love when people adapt and change Personalisation. Personalised yeah. toys, yeah. So cool. Pirate E.T. Um, sounds amazing. Thank you. Please keep getting those in on our face, Facebook and YouTube. We really look forward to hearing more from you. So, star item time. Star item time. Um, considering we are on YouTube tonight, like, should we do some unboxing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely. This isn't your usual unboxing. It's not from a, a famous chain um, named after a jungle. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so this is really interesting. Um, this is very special. Should we show it to everyone? Yeah. All right. We're just going to tilt that up. Hopefully you can see. This is so special. I hope you enjoy this. So this is no ordinary toy. This 
is a very lucky toy. This toy belonged to a lady called Edith Rosenbaum. And in 1911, Edith Rosenbaum, who lived in Paris, she was an American who lived in Paris, she was a fashionista, a writer. She was so talented. And she wrote for um, a fashion magazine. And when she was there, she met the love of her life over in Paris. And when she met the love of her life, she, she decided they were going to get married. And on the screen now, you can see the lady on the left is Edith. The lady on the right is an actress who played her in a movie. Now, Edith, um, just before you know, she was about to get married, they went to the horse races uh, with her fiancé. And unfortunately, they had an accident in a motor car, which is quite rare at the mm. time. And unfortunately, her fiancé passed away. Now, her mum... And this is where toys are really important. This is where parents and family comes in. Her mum came over from America just to see her, to make sure she was okay and give her love and support. Now, her mum bought her this pig, this toy pig. This is paper mache with real pig skin over the top. Very true. That's why it looks very real. And this toy pig was given to her while she was in hospital to cheer her up. Now, you'd probably think that's quite strange considering Edith's mother and Edith were both Jewish. You'd think that's quite strange. But the reason why is because Edith's fiancé was German. And it was her way of cheering her up and go, actually, it's, you know, this is a reminder of the person you loved. Now, this is very special. But we're going to fast forward a year. A year later, in 1912, Edith was asked by her work to go over to America. And Edith, you know, she had style. She had a lot of style. And if you come on our behind the scenes tours, which we have some tomorrow, um, you will actually see a pair of shoes which belong to Edith. And then you can book them on our links below. We'll show that later. But Edith was going to go over to America and she went on a ship you may have heard of from Cherbourg called the Titanic. Now, Edith was asked to go over to America with 15 bags of shopping. And these 15 bags of shopping were very, very valuable. And when she went over there, they had the finest trends and fashions in those bags and she was taking them over to New York to sell. But when she got on the boat, she knew everyone on this ship. She knew the Astors, the Guggenheims, you name it. She was top of the trends when it comes to cool, wealthy people to know. Now, on board, as you may hear, um, she lived life in the first class. She did everything. She had the best drinks. She, she went to the gymnasium, which had a mechanical camel, believe it or not. <laughs> I yeah, did not know that. I know, a mechanical camel. <laughs> and on the night when the Titanic hit the um, iceberg, she actually fought with her friends. They went onto the deck thinking it was snowing, and they had a snowball fight, which is really upsetting, um, actually. But what happened was Edith then... Afterwards, they told they had to go to lifeboats. And Edith was wearing these tiny little shoes. She wasn't prepared. And she wanted to take her bags onto the lifeboat. She was asked to go on lifeboat 11. But the, she, said, she said, I'm not going without my shopping, without these bags, my work bags. And they said, no, ma'am, you can only have one item. And she asked one of her servants to run down to her dorm. And this one item is this pig. So obviously, she grabbed the pig. And we know this because it's in our collection um, where this was given to us by Sir Walter Lord, um, who was a writer of the book Titanic and Night to Remember, which was then later turned into the movie. And the image you saw on the screen earlier was, um, was one of the actresses who played Edith in the movie. And if you watch that, you'll see this pig actually in it. Now, Edith was next to the lifeboat, and when she was holding, um, she was given the pig, she held it in swaddling like this, wrapped. And... Um, when she was there, she, she, for a minute, noticed the pig was taken from her by one of the officers and threw onto lifeboat 11. While the pig was thrown onto lifeboat 11, she stopped. And in her writing to Walter Lodge, she, that minute she realised her life, her family, was more important than any material goods. So she followed the pig onto lifeboat 11, which actually was the lifeboat which only had mums and their children on it. So she was the only one to be on there. She was about 25 years old. Um, and she was sat on that lifeboat uh, with the children. Now, this is no ordinary pig. If you look, um, you may have seen on the VT earlier, the, on the x-ray of the pig, inside here is a musical box. And this musical box, and if you look here at the tail, 
and this little rubber band, and when you move the tail, it plays a song. It plays La Sorella, which is an Argentinian waltz. And this was played for six hours while them, they were on Lifeboat 11 waiting for the Carpathia. The Carpathia took, arrived, picked them up. For, for those six hours, all those children were entertained by Edith and this pig. So toys, actually, come in many interesting forms. Yep, and many purposes too. Many purposes. As you can see, you think we're just about the sea, but it's not. We're about stories, narratives, and people because we're all connected to the sea, just like Edith, um, <laughs> just like Tracy, just like the lady who had the doll, and just like all those people um, who played dominoes at sea, like all those people who've played football, you know. Um, <laughs> over in Syria and war torn countries. So we want to say thank you so much for joining us tonight. But before we go, we want you to know what else is happening here at Royal Museums Grange because we've shown you some great items to play with. But what we want to, you to know, you want, we want you to be engaged with us with our summer of play. So we've got a great little video from my colleague and friend, Katie, who's going to tell us about how you can be involved with our summer of play. Hi everyone, my name is Katie and I'm the Families and Young People Manager for the National Maritime Museum and Queen's House. This summer we have signed the pledge to provide a summer of play across our sites, so we have loads of playful activities coming up for families. The summer holidays are going to be very busy at Royal Museums Greenwich. Every Tuesday you can come along to the Queen's House and take part in activities inspired by Royal Portraiture. We will be creating magnificent Tudor ruffs and wigs out of paper, creating 3D collages, striking poses, and so much more. On Thursdays across the summer, come and play outside. We will be running activities that bring the museum collection outdoors. Create a ship in a bottle, get jousting, and listen to stories or something different every week. On Sundays, we will be running playful indoor activities Join a sensory pirate story, make your own board games, or create a hat in the shape of a ship. And the highlight of our summer of play will be running between the 9th and 15th of August with outdoor garden games for families to enjoy in the grounds. In partnership with Gates of London, we will have giant dominoes, coits, and other games inspired by maritime life for the whole family to explore. For more information, visit rmg.co.uk slash families. Thank you for that, Katie. There's obviously so much to do. Come down, enjoy the summer of play. Um, we're hoping you're enjoying this too. We've got a few questions coming in, so thank you so much for that. The first question is actually for you, Ashley. Great. Um, how did you get into textiles conservation? Mm, that's a, yeah, that's a good one. Um, so I actually did a bachelor degree in fine art, and I did textile art. So I did embroidery and weaving and tapestry weaving. So I learned quite a lot about how textiles are, are made and uh, kind of the history of textiles. And so with that, um, you know, thinking about how I could bring that interest of making and history into a different career um, that wasn't an artist, um, I kind of fell into conservation, really. It kind of just seemed like the perfect blend of um, hand skills and history and uh, science, which I loved in school. So it was, yeah, it was just kind of a, a happy accident that I just sort of found. Oh, well, yeah. Well, actually, if you want to see Ashleen at work, um, tomorrow we at one thirty we are we are doing tours here at the Prince Philip Maritime Collection Centre. It's the first Thursday of every month. So if you would like to come along, go online and book your ticket now. And they are all COVID um, safe tours. You know, it's very limited um, amount of people, but you absolutely do it because what are you working on? To, what are you working on currently? Oh yeah. So if you come down, uh, what you'll see is a Greenwich Hospital pensioner's coat. So it's a blue wool coat that was worn by um, retired men from the Royal Navy who went to go live in Greenwich Hospital, which wasn't really a hospital, it was, it was a home for, for men who could, never, who could no longer work oh. at sea due to age or sickness, really. 
Um, but it's, it's quite an interesting story behind it because they had to wear these uniforms and adhere to very strict rules and regulations. So it's not really what we would think of um, you know, pensioner's home being today. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, a really, it's a really interesting object. No bingo on a Wednesday, then. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Come and find out yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> um, so we've got one last question here. And the last question is, oh, it's a classic one. Mm -hmm. uh, Keith wants to know, how valuable is the toy pig? Well, <laughs> mm. <laughs> Keith, we don't value in monetary ways when it comes to the collection because we're never going to sell the pig. So it doesn't matter to us. All the items here are priceless because they're yours. We're just custodians. We look after them. Um, but what we do value is its social purpose. Mm -hmm. What can we learn from it? And what we obviously see, we learned a lot from the pig tonight. So hopefully you've learned a lot tonight. And thank you so much for joining us on our Behind the Scenes Live. Ashley, thank you for joining us. Not a problem. Thank you to Katie, and Louise. Thank you so much. And a big thank you to you. We'll hopefully be back next month with another Behind the Scenes Live. So hopefully see you then. And if you enjoyed it, like it, share it. And if you've really loved it, come and visit us. Good night. <laughs>